folks, I've got a news flash for you. Factories can be very dangerous environments. I know, I know, I'm hearing you, my loyal Chalk Talk audience. So, Amelia, what other groundbreaking news are you going to share with us next? The sky is blue? The earth rotates around the sun? All right, all right. Maybe you already knew that your average factory floor can be a dangerous place. But did you know that at the heart of these environments, our industrial controllers and programmable logic controllers, or PLCs, can be especially vulnerable to these dangerous conditions that can include unknown wiring conditions, damaging high voltage, and noise-inducing emissions. Yep, we're talking about clamping down on failure and keeping our industrial controllers running safely and smoothly. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. If you're designing an IEC 61131 compliant digital outputs for these PLCs or industrial controllers, you need to have a plan to protect these outputs from a variety of unknowns. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Asa Kirby from Skyworks joins me to discuss an innovative new isolated smart switch device from Skyworks that gives you an unprecedented level of channel flexibility and protection, letting you offer your customers a truly set it and forget it solution when it comes to your next PLC design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Skyworks. Hi, Asa. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Okay, so clamping down on failure is a fun title <laughs> and something everyone can get behind, I'm sure, Asa. But I gather this is really about protecting 24-volt digital outputs like the ones you find on a PLC. So, Asa, can you start by explaining exactly what a PLC is? Yeah, no problem. So, PLC is a programmable logic controller. Sometimes they're also called industrial controllers, industrial automation devices. There's a lot of names in the industry for them, but the key is it's a ruggedized computer. The goal here is it's going to take digital and analog inputs and produce digital and analog outputs. And on the computer itself is going to be a user programmable interface where you're actually going to put in a program and create a closed loop control system with all these inputs and outputs. Now, in addition to all that, the program itself has to run for a very long time. So these things are usually running 24 hours a day, seven days a week with minimal interaction from users. And their lifetime is really measured in decades, um, not just in days. So this really paints a lot of the requirements of these devices. And then finally, in order to make all this interoperate together, there is an entire standard that is built to define these products. That's the IEC 61131 standard. Excellent. Now, Asa, we have talked quite a bit about industrial designs here on Chalk Talk, but when we're looking at a PLC, what kind of design considerations do we need to keep in mind? Yeah, great point. You know, honestly, the standard and the application we talked about on that last slide is really just half the story when it comes to the design considerations that a designer of a PLC has to keep in mind. Most of the considerations really come from the harsh industrial environment that these products have to live in on a daily basis. So, you know, for example, on this slide, I'm showing you a look at a control cabinet, a pretty large one. And we can see a lot of these considerations kind of building out here. Start with space is always constrained. If you look on the image on the right, right in the center on the right side is the actual PLC. And that product probably has hundreds of channels of IO. And that IO has to live on PCB space about the size of a business card. So really tight board space to start with. Next up, if you're looking at this image, you'll see there's a ton of different sensors, push buttons, motor controllers, relays, there's a HMI on the door. So these devices have to interoperate with a ton of different components. And so you have to be able to kind of plan for the unknown if you're building a PLC. 
Also, power is a challenge. You never know how power is going to be delivered to the PLC. In this case, the device we're showing a picture of here has a nice industrial power supply, 24 volts DC, well regulated, but it could be a battery that's powering the device. It could be running off of a UPS. It could have failover power. And again, you got to plan for that if you're building out this kind of a device. Put on top of that noise sources. You can see here that there are cable trays connecting all these different devices together and all these trays have the wires kind of commonly running together. It's a great opportunity to have noise coupling into the system. Not to mention the fact that when you get out of the cabinet itself, if you look on the left here on the slide, you'll see the kinds of equipment these wires are running past. Big AC inductive motors. So you're gonna couple on a bunch of noise on top of that. So you gotta deal with noise. You've also got to deal with just inherent conditions of the factory floor. It could be high temperature, could be high humidity. Not all factory floors are inside. There's quite a few of these type of applications that have to be running outdoors. And then finally, I like to kind of show this image of what a really crowded cabinet could look like after decades of upgrades and replacements and reuse. I have seen images from customers where a couple of decades go by and inside of their cabinet, it's just a rat's nest of wires. And you could easily find short circuits, open circuits, really electrically dangerous place to have all of these circuits running. And so as a designer, I have to think about making my product run for decades in these unknown conditions. And that's where a lot of the challenges come from. That makes sense. And it sounds like quite a challenge for our PLC designers out there. Now, I'll also guess that Skyworks has a solution to help them out, though. Is that right, Asa? Well, of course. I mean, that's one of the best parts of being here on Shock Talk is telling you about some of these new products that can really help out these kind of challenges. So in this case, I want to talk about our SI834X isolated smart switch. Now, this device is really an all-in-one solution to build this 24-volt PLC output type of channel. Now, this device, you can get it in a high side or a low side configuration. That means it can source or sync current, and you can interface to it through either a parallel or an SPI interface, depending on how a designer wants to build out their system. Now, the device itself has four channels, and each channel is a high-efficiency switch with 700 milliamps of continuous current and actually can provide up to 8 amps of current for 20 milliseconds to get through these high inrush current events like driving and like a lamp or something like that. On top of all that, we've built in a ton of protection. Recall from that last slide all the unknowns that these channels have to be built to survive. And so this really comes to play in protection. So we've got full high voltage galvanic isolation, built-in multi-voltage kick protection, open detection, short circuit protection, thermal protection. We've made it so that you can basically hit this thing with an electrical hammer and it's not gonna break. And then on top of that, we've put in a ton of diagnostics. In fact, eight diagnostics. That's an industry-leading number of diagnostics that we give back to the controller so you can understand the full state of the device when it's in operation. So Asa, I heard you say something about industry-leading diagnostics. Now that sounds interesting. Can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite parts of this product. As you can see here on this slide, we've really packed a ton of diagnostics and diagnostic reports into the device. This gives the designer of a PLC IO card the ability to really get exquisite detail on the state of each individual channel and the device itself. So you can really understand what's happening with the load and what the current state of each switch is. And we do this better than anyone else in the market. We've got eight different diagnostics or nine, depending on how you want to count it, three different diagnostics that are available per channel at different levels of severity. So you can choose to take different actions depending on how severe the issue is. And six different diagnostic reports that are available for the entire 
device, so at the device level, including a ton of detail about power supply input and a really unique communication watchdog that tells people what the status is of communication between the output side and input side of our isolated device. A lot of times the challenge with these kind of devices is communicating across a high voltage isolation barrier. So Asa, you're making a quite a big deal about diagnostics. I completely understand that. Now, is that because your device happens to be particularly good at them? Help me understand why these diagnostics are so important. <laughs> yes, well, I completely understand. It is something that we're really good at. But let me make the case for you why diagnostics are really valuable and frankly underused at this level in a PLC system. So the issue here is that PLCs are usually used as a part of a closed loop control system. Now, in a PLC kind of at the macro level, diagnostics are a pretty common concept, but at this very low level, individual channel and status of the channel, it's not a commonly used part. Instead, the common approach here to deal with all the different unknowns that happen on an output is that you build that output to have a lot of protections. You know, we've already talked about some of these protections that we built in. But the way this works usually is when the channel gets into a fault state, it becomes protected. And the way it's going to operate is different than in normal operation. But if that is not being communicated to the controller that is running this closed loop control program, the program has no way to know that the outputs it's sending aren't actually happening. And this can become particularly dangerous and make the system unstable. So let me give you a concrete example. Here in this slide is a nice picture of a automated sawmill. And you know, in this case, we're, it's a sawmill that's slicing a new fallen log, right? So imagine that you want to automate this with a PLC. It's a great device to try to automate. You're going to have inputs for safety, for example, making sure people don't uh, access certain areas. You're going to have operator inputs, that kind of thing. And then you're also going to have some outputs. Imagine that one of your outputs is a guard that's going to come down over the blade after the operator requests the log to be cut and that the system sees that you know nobody is in these unsafe zones. Well, over time, you could imagine a cable gets crimped and just shorts the output to this guard. That's something that could happen all the time in one of these really harsh industrial environments. Well, a normal output will just protect itself from that short circuit. It won't become damaged and the device will keep operating, but that guard is never going to go down over the blade. And without a diagnostic reporting this state, the overall control system will operate assuming that that guard is down, which can really create a dangerous condition for the device. Now, if there are diagnostics in place, you can report back to the controller, hey, I'm in a fault state. I am short-circuited. You could even report exactly what channel is faulted, how it is faulted, and that allows the control system to take countermeasures. You can place the whole system to a safe state and tell the operator, hey, go fix the device, or even tell the operator exactly where the problem is, letting you really reduce the amount of downtime for the machine, which, as we will recall, that's kind of one of the big things these PLCs are all about, running as much as possible for as long as possible with minimal user interaction. So these diagnostics, they're not just important, they're really critical to a well-designed system. Okay, so let's shift gears here a little bit. Now you talked about something called multi-voltage kick protection. So I know what inductive kickback is, but that mostly sounds like marketing jargon, to be honest. <laughs> so break it down for us. How do you control inductive kickback? <laughs> right, okay, so you know what uh, kick is. So inductive kickback. Uh, that's essentially the voltage spike you get when you interrupt the flow of current through an inductor. It's going to be proportional to the current's rate of change, and its polarity is opposite the supply. So depending on how fast that current changes, you can end up with a massive voltage across the switch in the output channel. And 
Massive voltage tends to break things when you don't design for it. Now, luckily, over the many years, the kick is a standard problem, and there's a lot of solutions on the market to dealing with it. So you know, let's just run through a couple of them really quick. So one of the most basic solutions is what's called a passive clamp. You can attach a diode right on the inductive load itself or a combination of diodes and kind of tune them uh, to be able to absorb a lot of this kickback voltage and bleed off the current in the inductor whenever you turn off the channel. Now, this can have some challenges. It either will bleed off current too slowly and it's going to reduce your performance, or it can bleed off too much current too quickly and you'll end up heating the whole thing up and causing some damage. So, an alternative solution is what's called clamping by avalanche breakdown. So in this case, you use kind of the FET that's built into your output channel. You exploit the fact that MOSFETs have a breakdown voltage. And with that big negative voltage kickback, it's going to potentially be hundreds of volts. And it's going to exceed the breakdown. And when you break down that MOSFET, well, there you go. You're clamping at whatever that breakdown voltage is. And you're going to let the MOSFET itself burn the power. But just like the passive clamp, you can end up in a situation where you're burning a ton of power in your switch. And so you really need to be careful how big your inductors are that you're shutting off. And remember, these PLCs, they need to be able to operate with as many different devices as possible. And so you want to be able to support as big of an inductor as you can, and you want to shut it off as fast as you can. So this can be challenging. The next option you have is what's called an active clamp. Now, an active clamp basically does something similar to that avalanche breakdown, but instead you're purposefully going to include kind of a passive uh, element and a switch element, and that lets you tune exactly what the voltage you clamp at will be. Um, and so this lets you potentially optimize for the speed of turnoff and the power burned, but Generally speaking, you're only going to be able to tune it for very specific devices. You're usually going to want to change that voltage depending on the kind of device you're dealing with. And so all of these solutions have their limitations, and they all are kind of represented as a challenge between trading off speed for power dissipation. So Asa, which of those implementations is the SI834X using? So what we actually use is a unique implementation of that active clamp. We call it the smart clamp, and you can see it kind of here on the slide. So here's a couple of things about this. And really, this is a unique implementation in the market. It's patent pending. To start with, we have our normal switch that's driving current into the load. And then we put a dedicated separate clamp in parallel with the load. So you can see here that we're gonna put that either above or below the switch, depending on if we're sourcing or sinking. So this is in relation to the supply. And then by putting this clamp in parallel with the load, we're creating a closed loop with the load. The next big innovation is that we're monitoring the current through the clamp during the discharge cycle, and then we're dynamically switching between different voltages, depending on the amount of current going through the clamp at any time. So that's the multi-voltage part of our clamp. So Asa, why is this approach better than the other traditional approaches? Yeah, so the key here is that with each of those options we talked about before, there's a trade-off. Broadly speaking, you're always having to decide between performance and power. Do I want to turn it off quickly or do I want to turn it off slowly so I'm not burning so much power? If I burn a ton of power, I usually have to limit how big the inductors are. If I turn off slowly, I can actually damage the load because I'm turning off too slowly. And for example, with a relay, you can end up with arcing in the contacts if they open too slowly, and that'll cause pitting, and it'll overall kind of reduce the lifetime of these products. So how do we build a product that lets you have the best of both worlds? That's what we're doing with this multi-voltage clamp. You can have your cake and eat it too. 
when we dynamically adjust the voltage, we start with a gentle clamp voltage when the current is high, letting the inductor do a ton of the work of dissipating power. We actually use the fact that there's some coil resistance and when the current is high, that's gonna actually have a quadratic increase in the amount of power dissipated. And then when the current reduces to a manageable level for our device, we switch to an aggressive voltage. And then we turn off that inductor quickly, bringing it through these sort of danger zones for most actuators where they could get damaged. So this optimizes power and turn off speed. And we get a huge reduction in power dissipation in our device. And by reducing the power dissipation in our device, we really are allowed to make our device small. That's why this device comes in a small DFN package and it lets us turn off big inductors. In fact, there is no limit to the size of inductor that we can turn off with this channel. And that's purely because of the way we're dynamically controlling the voltage that we're clamping at. Okay, I may not be following you all the way. Can you explain that a bit more? Yeah, let me give you a hypothetical example. Here on this slide, I'm showing, to start with, on the left, a traditional integrated clamp. It could be an active clamp that we talked about earlier, or like an avalanche clamp, either way. Um, it'll clamp at a high voltage, often over 20 volts. And when you add the supply to that, it's a huge voltage. So if you are looking at this graphic, you'll see that you know the difference between the 20 volt supply and the negative 21 volt clamp is a big distance. And that's also happening at a high current. In this graphic, you can see the voltage at the output is on the top and the current at the output is on the bottom. So P equals IV. So multiply your current by the voltage. I mean, that's like 30 watts of power is being dissipated in this device during this period of time. Inherently, that is going to heat up the device and you have a really good chance of breaking things. So you got to limit how much power you're dissipating. And so for most traditional switches, you just can't turn off really big inductors. That's the issue. Now, on the right side of the slide, you'll see the way our multi-voltage smart clamp works. Again, same hypothetical scenario. Voltage on the output is at the top. Current on the output is at the bottom. We charge up that device. We get it up to its rated current, and then we turn it off. As soon as we turn it off, notice that we bring it down to this nice and gentle 2-volt clamp level. Now, that's not going to turn it off incredibly fast, and you can see that the slope there on the current is going to be lower as we're slowly bleeding off that current, letting the coil resistance in the device actually bleed off a lot of the power. As soon as it gets down to 400 milliamps, that's a safe level that we've done testing to know our device is safe at. At that point, we bring it down to an aggressive 17 volt clamp and really shut it off nice and quick. And that brings it through all the dangerous parts of the actuator where it's going to be moving contacts, that kind of thing, and maintains that high performance. Okay, so that sounds great, but I can't see how your approach wouldn't lead to lower performance. Isn't it inevitable that when you clamp at a lower voltage that you're going to increase the time it takes to turn off the channel? <laughs> You're very perceptive. Yeah, I, I can't bend the laws of physics. We are making a little bit of a trade-off here. But let me show you a real-world example. This is actual bench data. So here in this slide, we are going to compare these two approaches. And let's look at the actual discharge time. So here on the left, you can see this traditional clamp turning off a 600 milliamp relay. There's a lot happening in this graphic. And so what I wanna really draw your attention to is kind of the bullets at the bottom. We've measured the amount of time it takes to fully turn off the device from the start of the turn off to when the contacts open up. And the total discharge time is about 18 milliseconds. But the amount of power that was dissipated, if you look at the amount of current by the voltage is about 2.6 watts of power. Now, on the right of the slide, you can see our smart clamp operating with the exact same load. Remember, this was done on the bench in our lab, same load, same current. We turned it off now with our 
smart clamp with its multiple voltages. We start at that gentle two volts, and then we bring it down to 17 volts. The total discharge time only increased by three milliseconds, but we reduced the power by 35%. And remember, power is dissipated energy that you have to build a big package for. So by cutting the power, we're able to make a nice small device, saves you board space, and it allows us to turn off any sized inductor you could attach to it just by reducing that power dissipation. Okay, so enough about kick protection. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about another big problem for 24 volt output channels on PLCs. I'm thinking overloads. So how does this solution deal with that in particular, Asa? Yeah, overloads are a fact of life for a PLC output channel. They can happen at any time. They're caused by all kinds of things, but essentially an overload is an overcurrent condition. You know, the most common idea here is a dead short. Somebody takes your output and ties it right to ground or ties it right to the supply, depending on if it's sourcing or sinking. And when you short circuit one of these devices, because the switches themselves are high efficiency, usually they're low RDS on, they can instantly damage themselves. This can lead to, not to mention damage to the channel, but you, know, you can cause a fire in a short circuited actuator. You can damage the actuators themselves. So it's a fundamental problem. It's something that every designer has to deal with. And as you can see on the right in this slide, there's some pretty traditional approaches to solving an overload. The most basic solution is just put a fuse on it. You know, a fused link will pop and then the operator can come in there and replace the fuse. If you want to be a little nicer to your customers, you can make it a PTC resistor or a poly fuse so it automatically resets. But the real gold standard for modern designs is what's called a foldback current limiting circuit. And this kind of a device operates by instantly changing the impedance of the channel to limit the current through the channel. So, Asa, I would assume that the SI834X uses a current limiting foldback circuit, right? Well, actually, we don't use a foldback current limiting circuit, and here's why. So here on this slide, let me walk you through the way this foldback current limiting circuit would normally work. And I'm going to point out some real challenges that come up with this type of a design. So in this hypothetical example, let me walk you through what you're seeing in the graphic here. Again, we're looking at the output of the device. You've got the voltage, that's VBN here in the, in the uh, waveform, and the current at the output, that's IBN. But I'm also showing you the temperature of the channel. And that's going to be really important. That's the TJ, so the junction of the actual switch in the package. So just like we did in some of our examples for the clamp, imagine that you're driving some sort of a load, doesn't really matter what it is. You turn on your output, the current increases up to the rated level. In this case, let's say 700 milliamps. That's what our devices is rated to. And then imagine that somebody just puts a dead short across the device. That's what happens at marker A. It could be that, you know, a big truck drove over the wire and crimped the cable and that shorted it. So the second that you short a device with these current limiting, this foldback current solution, you're going to increase the resistance of the channel to limit the current to some level. You know, in this case, let's say it's an amp of current. That's what we're showing here. But when you increase the resistance and you've got high current, what do you get, right? P equals IV. You get a lot of power and you're burning a lot of power. So what does that do to these devices? It increases the junction temperature. Now, luckily, most of these devices are going to have some sort of temperature protection. And the temperature is going to rise, usually up to a limit that's actually defined by the absolute maximum of the device. So about 170 degrees C is pretty common. And the second you trip that over temperature limit, the channel just shuts off and the device cools down to some lower hysteresis level. That's what we're showing at markers B and C here. And once you get below that level, the channel turns back on. Oops, hey, we're still in a short. So it limits itself and the temperature rises until it turns back off again, rinse and repeat. And this can go on. 
where the device is basically cycling right up at the thermal limit. And these short circuits, they can last for days, weeks, until somebody finally realizes that some output isn't working right. You know, imagine what this type of a solution does to a semiconductor, just letting it thermally cycle right at the maximum temperature of the device. It's not good. It leads to a reduction in the lifespan of the device. It's less serviceable. You can end up with parameter drift. This is not the most ideal solution to solving an overcurrent, just letting the device cook itself for as long as it takes for somebody to find it. So with the SI834X, we employ, again, a patent-pended solution called power estimation. In this slide, I am going to give you the same exact example of a device that we're powering up to 700 milliamps, and then you give it a dead short. Again, somebody maybe drives over the cable. Now, just like that traditional approach, we too would limit the amount of current in the channel by increasing our impedance but we only do it for a very short period of time. In that period of time, we are estimating the power in the channel and we just turn off as soon as we realize that we're in a short circuit. So we're, we're actively looking at the amount of power in the channel. We turn off for a period of time. And then as you can see here in the graphic at marker B, our channel turns on, but it basically sends small pulses. And if it's sensing, that it's still in a short circuit, it'll shut back down again. So in this way, by estimating the power currently being used by the channel and our device being smart enough to go, hey, I think I'm still in a short circuit. Let me shut off for a while and try again later. We never increase the junction temperature of the device. We don't thermally cycle the device. That takes less power and it leads to much better lifetimes for the devices. Okay. Well, Asa, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Yeah. So we talked about this new device from Skyworks, the SI834X. This is a isolated smart switch. It packs four low RDS on switches with a 500 milliamp output into a compact DFN package. It's got built-in channel protection. It's got open detection, short detection, thermal protection. It's got extensive diagnostics. Remember, diagnostics are important and we have an industry leading number of diagnostics reported back to the user. It's got built-in isolation so that the device will survive even in that harsh industrial environment where anything could go wrong. We've made this new patented smart clamp solution that provides really uncompromising inductive kickback protection. And we've got this novel power estimation technique that produces reliable overcurrent protection with indefinite short circuit handling without ever thermally cycling the device, unlike most other solutions on the market. And it's really all designed for PLCs that are compliant with this IEC 61131 standard. Excellent. Well, Asa, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, no problem. It was a pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Skyworks. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal.